Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for attending my talk today. And it's a great honor for me to be invited into um, a new community um, like SBIE. I feel so welcomed and embraced. So um, today, I'm going to share with you some of our recent development in um, bioelectronics. Um, so if you uh, think about wearable electronics, the first thing comes to your mind probably is mobile uh, health or uh, fitness wellness tracking. Mm, but actually, if you look into this um, uh, Beecham um, wearable technology application chart, you see that they can also find a lot of applications in uh, business sectors, in security and uh, identifications, in, um, including the uh, uh, communication with machines and also um, even glamours. So uh, essentially, um, every one of us is radiating data about ourselves all the time. Um, the problem is how to collect those data continuously in ambulatory settings and connect ourselves into the network. So um, if you look conventional um, wearable or non-invasive um, biometric sensors, uh, you see that they could be uh, pretty bulky and um, uh, constraining, um, not friendly to wear over longer um, time. Um, the, one of the difficulties um, I see as a mechanical engineer is the intrinsic mechanical property mismatch between human skin and uh, conventional wafer-based electronics. This is a shocking uh, silicon wafer, and you can see how brittle and fragile it is. In terms of mechanical properties, skin has a modulus um, that is six orders uh, smaller than silicon. And in terms of stretchability, sil uh, skin, you can stretch your skin by more than 50%, but uh, beyond 20%, you start to feel pain. So I call 20% to be the ouch limit. In terms of silicon, you can see it ruptures at 1%. The question is, um, before we get an ideal organic semiconductor that has the high performance and air stability as good as silicon, can we use silicon as a um, possible candidate for um, stretchable and skin-like electronics? The answer actually lies in mechanics. Um, if you think about the softness and stretchability of a device, it not only depends on the material property, but it also depends on the structure, the shape, the configuration. So here is a very simple example. A piece of a straight uh, paper ribbon, not stretchable. But if you cut the paper ribbon into this S-shaped serpentine shape, it will become immediately stretchable like a spring. So we have built mechanical and mathematical models to predict the stretchability and softness of this serpentine structures. I'm not going to show you equations, but if you look into those papers, you can plug in the geometric parameters and you can immediately get the stretchability and the softness. And here we show that by changing even just the angle of the serpentine, you can achieve a reduction of stiffness by several orders of magnitude, independent of materials. It can be um, polymer, can be silicon, can be um, uh, waveguides uh, for this optics and photonics community, um, you will get this structural um, benefits. And that gives us hope to build um, skin-like, tissue-like electronics out of intrinsically stiff and brittle materials. Professor John Rogers uh, used to be my postdoc advisor, and when I, before I left his group, uh, we um, initiated the first um, so-called epidermal electronics or electronic tattoos. It's different from the so-called um, electronic skins because electronic skins are developed for robots um, to mimic human skin uh, sensation capabilities, but electronic tattoos are developed for human to wear, and then you can uh, sense all kinds of physical and chemical biomarkers uh, on your skin, non-invasively. 
including, for example, electrophysiological signals, temperature, hydration, oximetry, and even uh, chemical biomarkers in your sweat, like glucose lactate. And, uh, and there are so many ongoing uh, exciting research. However, um, if we look into their microfabrication, um, it rely, most of them relies on photolithography and um, chemical patterning. The process uh, is uh, um, proved to be effective, but it, is, it could be time consuming and expensive. Um, therefore, we are looking at a possible solution um, that is dry and free form, meaning that you don't need to use any masks or stencils, and you can um, manufacture by design. There are um, something called additive manufacturing. You can do a lot of printing, but uh, you cannot print things like uh, gold. It's quite expensive, but gold is the most biocompatible metal. So um, we look into uh, a subtractive freeform manufacturing process, which um, leverages 300 dollar uh, worth of a mechanical cutter plotter. It's developed to cut paper arts, but you, why not cutting metallized polymers, or even conductive polymers, or even 2D materials? So we prove that you can actually apply this kind of mechanical cutter plotter and use a temporary support like a thermal release tape or a um, commercially available tattoo paper that has water soluble adhesive and you can um, put your um, functional materials on it and just perform the cutting to um, uh, make the patterns that you designed um, out of uh, just AutoCAD design, for example, and then uh, remove the excessive part. Uh, currently, it's manually, and then print whatever leftover devices you want onto a soft substrate. So to prove that we can make electronic tattoos using cut and paste process, my PhD student really twisted my arm to show you that this is a 10-minute, a um, $2 um, electronic tattoo. And um, it is stretchable uh, more than 100%. And um, after 10,000 cycles, resistance changed about 2%. And uh, for all kinds of skin tolerable def uh, deformation, there's n almost no degradation for the device. And if you um, ask what is unique about electronic tattoos compared with conventional wearable uh, devices, I would say that one of the uniqueness is the skin conformability at the micro scale. Uh, we know that if you have a rigid device uh, sitting on microscopically rough skin surface, the contact area is limited and therefore the uh, inter interface impedance would be high. And uh, also when the skin moves, a rigid device would have a relative displacement or shifting or friction on the skin. It may induce motion artifacts prior due to tribal elect electric uh, or um, even just uh, skin impedance changes. So therefore, we also develop models to understand how thick and how soft um, your device has to be to fully conform to your skin. What's the benefit? Here's a video. Um, if you compare gel electrodes, conventional commercial ones, 13 micron thick electronic tattoo and 1.5 micron thick electronic tattoo um, were on the same subject, when the subject moves, you can see that there is a motion um, related artifacts in um, the gel and 13 micron thick um, signal. But for the ultra thin tattoo, which fully conforms with your skin according to our model, it's almost immune from the motion artifacts. This gives hope for wearable and motion artifact minimized um, ambulatory sensors. Well, um, we know that we should make our electronic tattoos ultra thin. What's the thinnest materials on Earth? That would be graphene. So we looked into using graphene um, as a tattoo material in collaboration with uh, Professor Deji Akinwande at UT Austin. Um, Deji is a, a world-renowned expert on 2D materials and uh, nanoelectronics, and he's going to give a plenary talk uh, tomorrow at 11.15. So um, here, what we do is we can buy um, CVD large area graphene or grow that um, by ourselves. And uh, we have to apply a PMMA layer for the wet transfer standard process. 
And after etching the copper, we actually um, pick it up, the bilayer graphene PMA, um, by a tattoo paper commercially available with graphene facing up. And then uh, instead of doing photolethal, which is uh, um, time consuming and also can induce um, further chemical contamination on graphene surface, we simply use the mechanical cutter plotter to um, create whatever pattern, actually stretchable patterns. Um, out of the graphene PMA bilayer. Uh, the bilayer total thickness is uh, 500 nanometer. Uh, actually, graphene is monolayer, so it doesn't contribute to the thickness. And uh, also mechanical property, so it's dominated by PMA. And then we paste it onto, um, directly onto human skin. So here is a video to show you the graphene electronic tattoo sensor that gets on a piece of tattoo paper. We apply some water on the back side of the tattoo paper. The water goes through the paper and dissolve away the water soluble layer on the interface. And you simply peel it off. It's, the process is exactly like the transferring of a temporary transfer tattoo that kids are playing with. Here you see a piece of a, a graphene electronic tattoo on the skin. Because of the ultra uh, thinness, we observe this kind of ultra conformability. And it's also transparent. There is some reflective light from PMMA. And due to this ultra conformability, uh, what we have um, achieved something exciting is that the interface impedance between graphene and skin can be as low as the gel electrodes. Gel electrodes are, um, have, uh, are, are wet on the interface. They are known uh, for uh, a very uh, low interface impedance, high signal to noise ratio, and also um, uh, quite small motion artifacts because of this gel. But now with a, a completely dry electrode, we can achieve impedance as low as the gel electrode. Um, this can give you benefits in sensing. It can also give you benefits in stimulation. When you have um, high interface impedance, you have to apply high voltage to achieve a certain current level. Now, you only need to apply voltage at the same level as the gel electrodes. And essentially, what we prove is that graphene as a, um, a atomically thin material can behave um, as good as uh, 100 nanometer gold in all aspects, actually even better because of the conformability. It can be used to measure all kinds of electrophysiological signals, including uh, ECG on the chest, EMG on the right muscle, and EEG on the brain, skin hydration, skin temperature, and so on. Um, but you have to keep in mind that um, you have to apply the tattoo at the right location to measure the right signal. Uh, it's not a one tattoo doing it all. So um, that is something we have to keep in mind. So um, because graphene tattoo is uh, transparent and soft, imperceptible, so we feel that, OK, maybe now it's the time to wear a tattoo on your face. We don't normally see that. So here, we wear a uh, graphene tattoo on the um, upper side, uh, like above and below, and left and right to one's eyeball. So um, you can see a picture of this subject wearing the tattoos. Um, can you see anything? Um, believe me, uh, graphene tattoo is there. And using this kind of uh, um, tattoo, we can measure the electrophysiological signal associated with the eyeball uh, movement. When I, your eye is moving up, um, the uh, upper electrode uh, is going to measure, the, the bipolar up-down up electrode is going to measure a positive voltage. When your eye is moving to the left, then uh, the left-right channel is going to measure a signal. And um, we can be as sensitive as uh, four degrees. When your eyeball moves about four degrees, we can um, tell, we can get the signal. So using this kind of so-called uh, electro-oculogram signal, uh, we actually apply it to control a drone. So here, this subject is now looking up. You can see that the drone is following his eyeball movement. Now he's looking down. Then he's going to look to his left and right. So um, this kind of uh, um, human-machine interaction uh, also gives us uh, 
hope for like people with ALS who can only move their eyeball. They have a way to communicate with the world without wearing like a camera all the time in front of themselves. We can also use such uh, systems to, to track the eye fatigue um, for pilots and drivers and so on. So um, also, of course, uh, such systems can also deliver signals to give you feedbacks, and I'm not going to go into the details. So regarding the uh, wireless communication, well, Bluetooth is always an option, uh, but uh, normally you need chips as well as um, uh, batteries. So we look into the uh, battery-free uh, option uh, enabled by near-field communication. Um, that is what nowadays cell phones use for wireless charging. Um, and here you can see a piece of electronic tattoo that has no battery but it has a commercially available NFC chip mounted on it. There's also micro LEDs, photodiodes, uh, thermistors, electrodes, and other sensors. It, um, it is now powered by this uh, coil that's uh, within five centimeters distance. And uh, it can be used to measure things like uh, uh, ECG, hydration, temperature, uh, as well as uh, oxygen saturation level. But the problem is you always have to scan over it. It's episodic instead of continuous. But now we think that we also have a way to um, uh, do the continuous measurement. I'm not going to talk too much here. Um, so we uh, show that you can easily use a cell phone app to um, read your um, skin temperature or the ambient light, for example, when the cell phone blocks the photodiode on the uh, tattoo, you no longer see, uh, you see dropped light. So uh, using the same uh, NFC technology, basically, it is very ideal for implantable applications because now you don't have to have uh, batteries implanted. So this is a, a, a paper from uh, Professor John Rogers' group in 2016. And uh, in, inside this case, uh, actually um, on the edge of this case, there is a, a primary coil and embedded in the mouse brain, there is a secondary coil. And the LED is powered by uh, uh, the a primary coil. There's no battery inside. And you can use this kind of systems for wireless optogenetics and uh, optoelectronics. Um, a project I was involved um, for in vivo bioelectronics is the so-called heart sock. So um, previously, <laughs> you can only have single leads uh, to monitor <laughs> the heart. But now, by using soft electronics, you can have a three-dimensional electrical mapping of the heart activity, which matches perfectly with the optical approach. But the optical approach involves a toxic dye. So uh, with that, um, I would like to share with you a vision uh, for soft electronics. to make predictions, therefore I'm not afraid to be wrong. With that, let me acknowledge my group at UT Austin and my founding sources, and I would like to thank you for your attention.